and now you have a very chance to take the photo of the the Can you guess how high it is? Yeah. 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 We slow down a bit. Can we slow down? Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down. The Ruyong Hotel. My interest in this building after seeing a picture of it on the internet actually led to the reason why I came to North Korea. It's a 105 storey, 1300 metre dystopian knockout. We were always rushed past this building, which as it turns out became a kind of metaphor for the whole trip. This shimmering structure with its six revolving floors at its climax is an enormous empty shell. Construction began in 1987, then stalled for 30 years, and there it stood, a bare looming concrete hulk dominating the city. A few years ago they put the glass curtain wall on the outside and now it looks the part, but it's a kind of smoke and mirrors illusion. The interior is still lifeless and it's nearly 3,000 rooms have never been slept in. It's like a giant movie prop. One day I have no doubt the Ruyong will welcome guests. But time is not an issue for the North Koreans, it's the vision that counts. Dreaming bigger and better for the future is at the very heart of the North Korean psyche. They're playing an intergenerational long game. We never really get a chance to more closely inspect the Ruyong, but the dazzling capital itself is a large enough testament to the dream big philosophy. In the West we see images of this country of poor and hopeless poverty, and I'm going to try and show you those images. But first I want to show you where the Koreans think they should be. And this city is it. It's a showstopper, rarely seen, hardly visited, yet so globally important. Its striking architecture and enormous monuments create a deep sense of pride for its citizens, the nearly three and a half million favourites and the elite who form neatly rank and file behind the third head of a dynasty who've governed this republic for more than 70 years. For the visitor at first it feels disturbing. Its clean, wide boulevards are strangely alien. Its ambience were well, like a movie set. And right now in May 2017, tensions are at an all-time high on the Korean peninsula. President Donald Trump is waving his finger. Warnings are being earnestly issued. But this is really nothing new. This is as it has always been for those living in the DPRK. In the days leading up to my trip, missiles from inside the north rumble skyward. I do feel nervous. Is this really a nation gone rogue? It seems like nuclear Armageddon is only just over the horizon. Touchdown at the newly completed Sunan International Airport, built within only 12 months under a regime ordered speed campaign. The lights are off, the arrivals hall is all shiny but creepily empty. And within only a few minutes of boarding our tour bus, I'm left under no illusions as our government minder Mr. Lee reminds all of us about the people's vision and their purpose. Nowadays, uh, Trump administration uh, run a mark to stifle and isolate our republic with the nukes and sanctions. And, and also they, they will intervene, intervene in our Korea, in Korean questions. So facing these circum circumstances, our republic resolved the decision to develop the nuclear the deterrent, deterrent? Yes. deterrent, nuclear deterrent power very fast. Our, resolve, our republic resolved that decision and officially declared that declared, declared this throughout the world. So, yes. all of you came here as tourists to see our country. So, I want all of you for coming to our country. Thank you. The North Koreans are very proud of their nuclear program. We will get up close and personal with the children training to be scientists and even the rocket technology itself. 
North Korea wants a seat at the table of nuclear nations, and for me, a week in the country will prove that they will stop at nothing to get it. Travel inside the DPRK is like a con version of a prison bus transfer. At all times, you'll be wedded to these people, the guides of the Korea International Travel Company, Mr. Lee, Ms. Kim, and Ms. Hand will be part guide, part government minder, part friend, part spy, part converted to the ways and the ideals of the real Korea. You will see their version of the country. You will not be able to move freely. You will get on the bus and you will get off the bus when they say and with whom they say. The rules of engagement are simple and they are set in stone and cannot be changed. The only room for manoeuvre and negotiation of those rules is a questioning of each other's minds. The only freedom a traveller to the DPRK has is within his own mind, and by the end of it, even in there, questions will start to linger about what is right, what is wrong, and what is just. No one walks away from the DPRK unchanged, myself included. Tens of thousands of tiny dots on the cobbles in Kim Il-sung Square. They're used to line up the people to exacting precision, the vision of this city we so often see in the West when the regime displays its prowess backed by goose-stepping military. It's a graphic indication of how precisely everything is planned to the millimetre in a nation where even the slightest misstep can end in death. But today, there is merely silence. And then a question from Mr. Lee. <laughs> I look like a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> that tangential probe would underscore the tone for the rest of the week, as our mutual suspicion overshadowed every interaction and led to long evenings drinking together where he would try to question my motives and I would do exactly the same to him. A mental game of cat and mouse, where I was never quite sure where his questions would leave me, and he was always in fear my questions would confirm deep-held prejudices he was sure I would take back to the West. That is, if they decide to let me leave the airport. To those from the West, North Korea appears cloaked behind an iron gauze of secrecy, and to peek behind this steely curtain, one must submit to the tightest of conditions and be prepared to be challenged at every opportunity. For the North Korean and the outside tourist lies a prospect for conversion, and for the outsider a possibility for questions to be resolved. Only around 4,000 Westerners enter the country each year, and many will leave the DPRK conflicted and confused with more questions than answers can ever be given. This entire snafu is an education in perplexity. It begins with indoctrination. Now, all humans are indoctrinated to a certain extent, but in the West we're also fortunate enough to be able to freely question. This is not so in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. For the North Korean people, indoctrination begins at birth with subtle symbols burnt into the mind and heart at every opportunity. No street is left bare, no factory corridor is forgotten, no kindergarten, school nor workplace. Metro stations are adorned with nationalistic mosaics and giant statues to the leadership are scattered in their thousands across the countryside. 
Every citizen, some 25 million, wears a small lapel pin across the heart, bearing the faces of either the Eternal President, Kim Il-sung, or his son, the Eternal Leader, Kim Jong-il. children of the nation bow down to the leaders and thank them for providing and giving freely everything they need. These children attend kindergartens enriched with seemingly innocent iconography. count numbers. They learn about the traffic system. And they rehearse and recite endlessly. If they're good enough, in the kindergarten, they'll end up here at the Mangyongde Children's Palace. This is the palace for extracurricular education for, for children after school. This giant building with its two curved outstretched wings is said to represent a mother's arms embracing her child. And inside, an acid-like trip designed to ensure the brightest young stars of the Republic can sparkle and shine and give glory to the leadership. Crawling through its 650 rooms across six levels leads me to the end game for these children. The 
right to perform to chosen guests in a 2,000 seat grand auditorium. This is North Korea today. story Yangakto International Hotel, our home for most of this trip. It sits marooned on an island in the Taedong River. Its dramatic marble foyer is a delusion of splendour. Its basement bunker houses bars and entertainment facilities. A revolving restaurant caps its steel facade. The choice of steel is appropriate because for the tourist, the Yangakto will be as self-assured as any prison. With sightseeing concluded for the day, no one has the possibility to leave. Anyone tackling too far from the hotel doors will be stopped by the many military guards wandering the grounds. This is five-star hotel chic, DPRK style. Everything is strategic, everything is prepared, nothing can be left to chance. If one has an unguarded mind and is prepared to inaudibly submit to the cloistering, then the doors will slowly begin to open, never quite fully, maybe just a slight crack, allowing just a peek inside. The veneer can never fully be protected, and travel to this country will change you forever. It may also change the people you meet here, as they too probe and consider the lives we take for granted in our own Western communities. Inside the Yangakto elevator, the fifth floor button is missing. Only a description on the wall hints at what may be there. But just as the KGB monitored hotel guests across communist Eastern Europe in the glory days of the Soviet Union, the hidden communications floor at the Yangakto may be listening more to the activities of its visitors than broadcasting any television programs. The many wires leading to the console in the hotel room is acutely unsettling and leaves one with no illusions.
However, I was never particularly worried by any hint of bugs in my hotel room. Unless I was talking to myself, there was nothing to be said in there. But watch us, they do. And we watch them. The fifth floor of the Young Gutto is where the American student Otto Warmbier got into so much trouble only a year before my own trip. It's here he allegedly stole a political poster from its walls and was sentenced to 15 years hard labour inside North Korea for what the regime called hostile acts against the country. He died only days after being repatriated to the United States a couple of weeks after my return. Undercover journalists too could be subject to similar incarceration. And while I'm no longer a journalist, the mere fact that I had been for more than 20 years could have caused enough suspicion on the part of my government minders to at the very least insist my footage was deleted as I departed at the airport. I pushed the more worst case scenarios to the very back of my mind. A casual stroll up the marble staircase in the lobby of the hotel reveals another interesting photo stop. Normally off limits, this mezzanine floor hides a strange little secret. This is the head office of the Daesong Credit Development Bank. The bank facilitates and proliferates financial projects on behalf of the regime and leads back to a room in this building, the Korean Workers' Party headquarters in Kim Il-sung Square. Inside this building is a space known as Room 39. Set up in the 1970s, Room 39 and those who work out of it run the DPRK's so-called court economy, which is responsible for generating billions of dollars in foreign exchange annually to be used by the leadership. It's a secret slush fund which supports not only the country's nuclear program, but also ensures the regime can live in the style it has always been accustomed to. United Nations sanctions have proved to be no barrier for Room 39 and its clandestine connections which stretch across the global financial network. Whether it's the illegal drug trade, counterfeit $100 US bills, international insurance fraud, arms deals, or this, the KKG taxi fleet which we see carrying the chosen ones through the streets of Pyongyang. KKG, according to the Financial Times, is a joint venture between a faction of Hong Kong investors known as the Queensway Group. With most North Korean companies, either under US, EU or UN sanctions, the KKG Group operates in the shadows, but it's very effective. Not only are the patrons of KKG taxis required to pay in foreign currency, that's only a small part of the operation. The use of flags of convenience helps shelter a massive North Korean operated shipping fleet and the Queensway Group's interests from Zimbabwe to Manhattan help the world's most isolated state keep its financial head above water and the nuclear arms show firmly on track. a close watch on everything. Even in the poverty-stricken woodland countryside, the eyes are there. The DPRK purchased hundreds of thousands of these cameras in the mid-2000s, and a sophisticated system of reporting on each other amongst its citizens has operated enduringly. To live in and visit this country means existing with an ever-looming backdrop of distrust. But I was certain not to let my own paranoia overshadow what would prove to be a fascinating and insightful trip. Taedong River, 
and the people of Pyongyang awake as they do every day to the musical sound of a patriotic call to action as we set off for the countryside. Uh, so while we're going, uh, please check again. You have everything with you now. I lost so this cooperative farm is a very significant place as our president Kim Il-sung visited here 16 times and our chairman Kim Jong-il visited here four times and our marshal Kim Jong-un, our current leader, visited here twice. This model cooperative farm is a gift from the leadership. Its hot houses produce beautiful cucumbers and tomatoes. Cucumber. This is one? Yeah, just ah. picked from here. You can pick? Ah, uh, she no. picked for me. Its workers are housed in simple but adequate fashion. This father proudly shows us his home. His sons are in the military. But despite the famine of the 1990s, where as many as 3 million Korean people died, this image is one of food prosperity. When the DPRK lost its eternal president, Kim Il-sung, in 1994, it coincided with a great time of turmoil. Its old ally, the Soviet Union, had collapsed and largely abandoned the North Koreans. Floods ravaged the country and the old communist public distribution system collapsed. The decade that followed was called the arduous march. Those times fortified the current generation and the changes born in that decade now drive the current resolve. Any desire for future generations will only be achieved on a full stomach and an army always marches on its stomach. Filming of the military in the DPRK is strictly banned but in a country which boasts one of the biggest armies in the world, no camera shot can be engaged without capturing a uniform. The North Korean People's Army claims more than a million active troops and nearly seven million in reserve. This is not only a police state, it is a country still actively at war. The cooperative farm is so neat and tidy, yet there are almost no workers in sight. Who really works these fields? As we leave, it becomes somewhat clearer. Sure, okay. When the current leader, Kim Jong-un, visited these hot houses in 2016, he proclaimed it to be a beautiful farm of the future a model farm to be replicated throughout the nation. The sign erected by the workers says it all. Let's thoroughly accomplish the words spoken by dear leader Kim Jong-un on his visit. His regime knows that food is at the heart of this realm and nothing will be achieved unless the people have it. But while the model farm is beautiful in its strangely precise way, it contrasts deeply with the true reality of country life in North Korea. Modern farming equipment is almost absent, but while the fields do seem to produce crops, that achievement comes through back-breaking human labour, assisted by beasts. There's no doubt that today food is being grown successfully inside the DPRK. We pass hundreds of kilometres of fields all being tended to in the old-fashioned way, but it was never made clear whether the food is distributed fairly or if the people really are still starving in this country. Sheer human endeavour seems to overcome many shortcomings in the DPRK. Wide, open and empty highways, the justification of that. Our guides proudly proclaim this is an important human contribution to the nation. We're told these heavily rutted concrete highways were built in a matter of months by 200,000 strong young Koreans. We'll spend hours on these roadways, the bone-jarring ride only ceasing 
as we stop at the many military checkpoints along the way. So, uh, would you please uh, don't make no, a photo okay. of the checkpoints? Of course, the army too can move effortlessly along these giant motorways. But the only tanks we saw were lined up in their hundreds on the back of train transporters, and it proved impossible for me to capture those on film without being noticed. What do you say, the three charters? So the round one has the Korean map, and below the Korean map there is the letter, Korean letters, which is a street. Of course, every so often dramatic monuments appear. This one is a hail to Korean reunification. It was built in 2001 to embody the desire of the eternal president Kim Il-sung that the Korean peninsula should once again be whole and at one under the northern ideology. The two Korean women, in national dress, are holding a united Korea on a globe. Then it's back again to the wide open highways, rutted and potholed, lumbering on like a crumpled ribbon across the carefully ploughed fields. And to another collective farm. And like all North Koreans, respect is given to the eternal president, Kim Il-sung. Propaganda audio blares endlessly. Mostly it's the leader's speeches on repeat, day and night, night and day. Neat rows are displayed, but once again no recognisable workers apart from a lone woman watering the vegetables. And there are those military uniforms again. No sign of workers again as we pull into the Kangso Mineral Water Bottling Factory. The production line is silent, the neat green bottles are all lined up and ready to go, but no one is there. And it's at this point that I'd had enough. Can we not see it going? Why don't we why don't we wait until they come back? You, you want to wait? You want to wait here? Yeah. You want to me or want to move to Pogu? I think 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 I Get the production line going. <laughs> yeah. There comes the... <laughs> my insistence was met by mirth by my fellow travellers, but I was becoming increasingly suspicious that what we were being shown wasn't the full picture. Why this constant charade? Why this desire to imply all is well? Why didn't this all stack up in my mind? While my demands were met and a few workers raced to get the machines underway, I still felt very unsettled. Say? This is Texo, uh, the food stop, uh, food stop, general food stop factory. The general food stop factory. factory. Uh, cool. My suspicions about what we were being shown were hardly dispelled at the next factory, a production facility which supposedly makes wine, sweets, and biscuits. Okay. And 
vinegar, and have you tried the makgeolli? We're shown rows and rows of product, but the use-by date seems somewhat dubious. Some were from 2008. Long, dark, empty corridors, silent computer rooms, the ubiquitous propaganda posters, and a lone worker vainly trying to repair a production belt with a needle and thread. One production line, however, is running. It's the biscuit line. But then I notice the logo on the boxes. This is all funded by the World Food Programme. These biscuits are being produced for the local orphanage with international funding. Soon we arrive at a little hotel in Pyeongsong. It's not as agreeable as the Angakto International. The South Island of New Zealand has fallen off the map for a start. But from my hotel room, I see how the real people of North Korea are living. As propaganda audio filters from loudspeakers in the distant streets, the ordinary citizens of the DPRK go about their daily activities oblivious to my western eye. On the television, a vision of Pyongyang, the utopia, complete with the boast that the city has the freshest cleanest air in the world. There's no hot water at this hotel and the power supply is, well, intermittent at best. The following morning we visit the Kim Yong Suk Higher Middle School. Physics is the order of the day. Pyongsong is a bit like the Silicon Valley of North Korea. Hey, nice to meet you. Uh, so welcome only to the school. So he's the vice headmaster of the school. So this student participated like uh, in 1990, 1991. Oh, we are, uh, we are studying uh, physics. Physics. Yeah. Do you find it hard? Difficult? Yeah. Uh, of course it's difficult, but I think it's the basis of the science. Yes. And these young 17-year-olds are in no doubt how their skills will be used. Oh, I want to be a physics scientist. I like physics very much. Yes. These are North Korea's future nuclear scientists. In the future, I'm going to try hard to uh, to make our country uh, most strong in the world. Yes, good. Strongest in the world. Strongest in the world. Yeah. yeah. And back in the capital, we get perhaps the most dramatic demonstration of where these physics students will end up. The big Unha rocket launch vehicle, which was used to deliver the Bright Star satellite into space in 2012, hangs proudly at the core of the Pyongyang Scientific and Technology Centre. Its delivery system closely mirrors the Taepong Dong 2, the DPRK's version of an intercontinental ballistic missile. The very one which now strikes fear into the hearts of the United States government, and the recent tests of which have sparked unprecedented tensions in the region. 
The scientific centre itself is a marvel. The building is shaped like an atom and was built in only one year at the orders of Kim Jong-un. That atom and its all-seeing eye logo demonstrates a slightly sinister iconographic portrayal of the importance of science at the core of the North Korean human endeavour. The centre proudly boasts hundreds of supposedly North Korean-made computers. This one is where the leader sat at the grand opening of this edifice. An interesting side note is the fact that North Korea runs its computers on its own operating system. It's called Red Star, and it's based on a version of the Apple operating system. And just as Apple watches us, the Red Star watches the people of the DPRK. Hidden coding cleverly lets the leadership know if someone has been watching something they shouldn't, say, for example, like a foreign movie or a TV program smuggled across the border on a memory stick or a DVD. That's a big problem in the DPRK. There's no access to the outside internet for ordinary citizens. The very top brass do have access to the World Wide Web, but most people make use of the DPRK intranet. It's called the Kwang Mayong, which roughly translates as the walled garden, a precipitously controlled, highly tightened version which we would all recognise as the internet, but which in the DPRK delivers only state-sanctioned information. In the scientific centre, the hundreds of computer screens sit mostly blank, apart from a few children doing what most children do on computers. There's no one else in the centre. We're told most are at work, but the doors are freely open for the citizens of Pyongyang at any time. It's suggested that if we come back at the weekend, we would see more activity, but for this tightly controlled tour, that proved to be an impossible scenario. Instead, our guides prefer we receive an unprecedented view of this city. The national airline Air Corio owns an ageing rushing helicopter, and the views from its windows will prove to be impossibly ungilded. It's surprising the helicopter ride is part of the tour because it offers up a full view of the more unphotogenic parts of the capital. We view what appear to be prison camps, the long bumpy motorways, the giant coal-fired power station which valiantly tries to supply an increasingly unreliable national grid with power. There are the dirty parts of the capital where on the ground our tour bus never ventures, but then the capital's soaring skyscrapers begin to emerge. Our views of the construction methods used to build these striking buildings were clearly seen on the ground, but it proved virtually impossible to film that from down there. Indeed, the filming of any construction site up close in the DPRK is banned, but most seem to be swarming with military workers. The concrete methods and lack of rebar seemed concerning, even to a layman like myself, but despite how they are built, it would be disingenuous to describe Pyongyang's skyscrapers and monuments is nothing short of impressive. We sweep high above the Taedong River. The big pyramid hotel is there, and this is Future Street. All of these high-rises lining the river were built for the scientific workers of the nation in just seven months. There's the scientific centre itself. Its atom shape is very clear. And the May Day Stadium, off limits to our tour group, it's the largest such structure in the world. It's most famous for hosting the Ariane Games, a mass demonstration of systemic dexterity 
where 150,000 people rhythmically move in theatrical unison in an affectionate matrix to the ideals of the regime. There too is Kim Il-sung Square running opposite the Juchi Tower. This tower is a monument to the nation's innermost ideology. Built of exactly 25,550 blocks of granite and capped by an ever-glowing red flame, the second Kim is credited as its designer. At its point by the river, a Workers' Party monument sits at its heel. And it's on the ground we get up close and personal with the driving dogma of the North Korean. Tribute plaques from sympathetic Juchi practitioners from all around the world mark the entrance to its cool interior. A tiny elevator slowly lifts us up to the observation rotunda beneath its gold-lipped flame. Juchi is the guiding doctrine for the people of the DPRK. Practiced by the eternal leader Kim Il-sung, it is, I am told, an endlessly original, brilliant and revolutionary contribution to national and international thought, essentially a path to pure socialism. It was perfected by his son and is defined simply by Ms. Kim. So Tu Tai Du was created by President Kim il in 1930s when he fought against the Japanese. And the Tu Tai Du is a philosophical principle which says that the human being, I mean, the, you are the master of your own destiny, you are the master of revolution and construction. Yeah, there is the Tu Tai Du breakaway. So the, there is a public meaning of self-reliance. Yeah, it's a true idea. But the whole meaning is we are, you are the master of your yourself. Kim Jong-il took what was the more conventional Marxist-Lenin form of socialism and sort of reworked it into a North Korean-specific philosophy. The idea of national independence, economy and self-defense is prevalent in the Juchi idea, but the manifestation and rollout of the dogma across more than half a century in the DPRK has created a state less recognizable as communist and more in tune with the fascist motives of the Nazis. Race ideology also appears to be at the core of Juchi. That combined with the mass military demonstrations we so often see in the West reminds me more of Nuremberg as the dark days of war loomed in the mid 20th century. The ubiquitous lapel pins worn by the people here in the DPRK seem to harken to the days of the 1930s when German allegiance was proudly displayed across the hearts of all those loyal to that regime with the Nazi party badge. The DPRK lapel pins, I'm told, are given to individuals by the Workers' Party. The different types denote different levels of loyalty. The pins featuring both leaders represent a higher standing. They're only ever issued to those who demonstrate the most unwavering dedication to the DPRK. And I'm informed that I too could be presented with a lapel pin if I demonstrate special loyalty. Simply returning to the DPRK for a second trip could easily qualify. My interest in Juchi, however, is very genuine. I'm quite intrigued. It forms the basis of many conversations with Mr. Lee. Indeed, he presents me with a book written by Kim Jong-il describing the Juchi ideal. It's at this part of the trip that my relations with Mr. Lee begin to thaw, whether by my interest in Juchi or a developing trust that I'll go back to New Zealand and present the DPRK in the best light, he kind of slackens. And soon our tour party appears to have more freedom to meet the people. What appeared at first sinister and oppressive to my western eye begins to thaw and that iron gauze curtain begins to slide away. It's May Day, and the Pyongyang nomenclatura are gathering for a day of festivities. We wander through thousands of families with tiny barbecues enjoying abundant food and yes, 
they appeared very happy. This could be an ordinary day of holiday fun in the West. Families, food, booze, and even games. And of course, a patriotic song or two, just as a reminder of where you really are. Back in town and more connections with locals, it's still impossible to actually speak to them, but we are closer now than ever. And soon we swing below ground, deep below. The escalators deliver us to the deepest metro system in the world, over 130 metres beneath the capital's quiet concourses. Once the rhetoric in the West described the human bustle in these stations as mere actors portraying the illusion that Pyongyang is a true functioning city. But these are not actors. This is the real daily life in a city where the subway tunnels double as nuclear bunkers. Filming towards the tunnel entrances is forbidden. It's here where the giant steel shelter doors are located, and in the worst case scenario, hundreds of thousands can shelter, oblivious to any nuclear holocaust above. The Pyongyang Metro is a two-line, 16-station glorification to the leadership. Its Soviet architecture and beautiful mosaics most certainly dazzle. The rolling stock came from East Berlin at the height of the Cold War.
These train carriages even still carry the graffiti of the disaffected East German young people who scrawled across its windows before they were shipped to Pyongyang in the late 1970s. At this stage of my trip, I've got to be honest, things start to blur. My mind is in overload. What am I actually seeing here? What is this country? Who are these people? There's no relief in sight, and indeed there are more sights to see. More bowing to the leadership, more slanted ideology. The tourist show, well it must roll on. And it's back to those highways again, to one of the most important places, the birthplace of Kim Song Il, the Mingyongde native house. Now this house, we say that this is the house of the older hearts of the Korean people. So without the birth like the, of our present Kim Il-sung, we cannot think of the new Korea and now the present Korea. Beside the birthplace of the father of the nation lies an amusement park. It's Disneyland Pyongyang style. It seems strange that in the grounds of the birthplace of the father of the nation, roller coasters soar and bumper cars collide, or perhaps that metaphor is an accurate indication of the tumultuous burnishing of a nation. It's ups and downs, it's good times, and it's bad. Back in the hotel, I carefully fold my copy of the Pyongyang Times, as instructed. Never can the face of the leader be folded, crumpled or discarded in a rubbish bin. Its pages depict the single-mindedness of the nation. I carefully fold and tuck it away for later. That single-mindedness would soon be on show for real. You see the entrance gate to the like demilitarized zone. So the demilitarized zone is like controlled by the soldiers. So uh, it is there is a kind of restrictions of taking photos here. So North Korea is still in a state of war with its southern neighbor. No with anxieties at an all-time high, my expectation of the demilitarized zone, the 200-kilometer-long, 4-kilometer-wide no man's land, which separates the north from south, is one of worry. It's variously described as the most dangerous border in the world, and I'm expecting it to be a place of heightened emotion. We pass barbed wire fences, rocky tank traps, and minefields. There are around a million troops stationed along both sides of this flank. With no peace treaty, just an armistice agreement, this battle rolls on, and there have been skirmishes on this border over the years, even death, but today it sits in manicured silence. In the 1980s, the South Koreans built this giant flagpole. The DPRK quickly built a taller one, in fact, one of the tallest flagpoles in the world. Various villages, we're told, live on both sides, inside the demilitarized zone itself. We pass the DPRK village, but it didn't look very occupied. And the North Korean side of the DMZ is relaxed, impeccably clipped. Well, almost, as I push my filming luck just a little bit too far. Yeah. 
맨날 찍어가지고 뭐 나가서 누구한테 보여줄라 그니까. So you're always taking picture of him and why are you gonna show this pictures? I'm taking pictures of everyone. <웃음> 나 찍잖아 <웃음> 지금. Of you? Yeah. He doesn't like it? Maybe. Okay. 콘크리트 손이 미국에서 생겨난 군사분 개선입니다. So the concrete line that across the seven buildings is the military demarcation line. At the border itself, we enter the tiny blue huts. and the concrete borderline that passes right beneath the little building. It's here you can cross over to the south, but two guards stop anyone from opening that door. The air in the room is the same in the north as it is in the south. But what's behind that door? Maybe a hail of gunfire and certainly according to the North Koreans, the corrupt southerners and those evil Americans. So in this building, from the uh, July the 27th to the March 1991, over 10,000 times of meetings were held. So through the meetings, we condemned the new provocation acts of the U.S. against the Republic. 미국의 정전협정 위반 행위는 판문점 사건과 푸에 글로바 사건을 비롯해서 정전 후부터 1991년까지 81만 5천여 건에 달합니다. So the U.S. provoked. Instead of learning a lesson from the past, they they always cling to the kind uh they cling to the provocation acts against the republic, including the Pueblo incident and 판문점 incident. 정전협정을 체계적으로 파괴한 미국은 1991년 Gosh, there's nothing between that door and me, apart from those two surly men. What would they really do if I bolted? Those who visited the southern side describe tourists as being told that any wrong move could start a war. There are lists, long lists of do's and don'ts, dress codes, no pointing, no waving, no eye contact, no pictures. But not here in the north. We're pretty free to laugh, photograph and get ultra close to the military. Well, almost. The southern side is empty. A previous agreement ensures their tourists never see their northern counterparts. But the cameras on the southern side still watch us all the same. All that rhetoric at the border is backed up by a glorious display at the victorious Fatherland Liberation War Museum back in the capital. This giant set piece to the Korean War of 1950 to 53 comes complete with a captured U.S. Navy ship. So after we received this letter from the U.S. government, we sent all the crew members back to their country. And here, this is a picture of a captain, the captain of this pueblo, and his name is Lloyd Mark Bucher, and he's writing a confession. The USS Pueblo and its men were caught, according to the North Koreans, while carrying out espionage activities in the territorial waters of the DPRK in 1968. It still remains as the only captured US Navy ship in the world. Its bullet-popped hull is proudly displayed. Bullet holes. Bullet holes. 
the sign of battle is over there. This is the holes from the bullets. Where, where the fire, when they were firing. Yeah. Okay. So it really was a very vicious fight. And here? Yeah. So the, the red dotted circle, it all shows the... The bullets. Yeah, the bullets. Wow. Mm. So it was... And here? Yeah. A shell? Okay, it was quite serious. In the middle, this is captain's uniform, and you will see the captain's picture and the flag of Pueblo and mark of the ship. Well, you see, Pueblo means people in Spanish, and there's also other uh, meaning of. 83 men were captured, and one died in the attack. The men were released following torture, according to the US, 11 months later. The War Museum itself is horribly awe-inspiring. Filming inside is banned, but the sight of a New Zealand flag ripped and torn in one of the static displays combined, the North Korean version of events leaves me shattered. Any objection to the way these events are portrayed is simply met by silence from our military guide. And once again, the tourist in the DPRK is forced to conform, forced to hear it the way they see it. I can do nothing but retreat back into the freedom of my own mind and allow the show to whirl on endlessly around me. The North Korean story is amplified once again at the concrete wall. And in the center, there is the military demarcation line without eye above wires. But after the military demarcation line, they built the concrete wall of the south line, after the south line. So there you can find the concrete wall there, the brown color ones, and there are the point, military soldiers' posts, like every one to meters. You've heard about the yeah. Berlin Wall, but have you heard about the Korean Wall? According to North Korea, the wall, built between 1977 and 1979, is a 240 kilometer long, five to eight meter high reinforcement. It's packed with soil sloped from the southern side so vehicles and military personnel can easily access it. The sloped soil also makes it completely invisible from the South Korean side. And that is the southern boundary line. The United States and South Korea claim that the wall does not exist. But the DPRK is more than happy to show it off to its tourists. But I had a hard time finding anything. Sure, there were South Korean military posts dotted along the hilltops, and there was something that looked like a concrete buttress briefly appearing between two gullies. But really? A wall stretching the width of the entire Korean peninsula? I'm not so sure the North Korean set builders have managed to entirely pull this one off. I did check Google Earth on my return home and uh, I did find a line stretching across the country but this looked equally like a road and I can find no evidence anywhere, not even a picture, a plan, in fact, nothing, no wall. As the bus swings back towards Pyongyang, I wondered what the workers in these fields thought about this wall supposedly snaking less than a few kilometres from their homes. Again that night the food is laid on excessively as it has been for the whole trip, whether it's eating dog stew and caisson, which I would describe as a sort of a lamb mutton sort of a 
tasting thing. And this is it here, you can see it. Jorge, what do you think? Excellent. Beautiful? Yeah. Tastes like a Mexican soup called menudo. It's very good. Justin? It's great. Nice. Tasty. Spicy. Did you get a bit of gristle or something? Nicole, call that the Apple. It's good. Oh good. What do you think? I would say it's it's very good. It's really like a mutton, mm. and it's quite uh, a lot of calories. So I think that as a food, you know, as a meal itself, it it's, it's quite enough. Yes. 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 And it's spicy, but it's very good. Very good. Yeah. Well, I think what we've got there is the seal of approval on the dog. Nothing wrong with it. Quite nice. We're, we're going with it. The North Koreans are exuberant hosts, always smiling and always ready to sing. And it's this smiling hospitality with more food to come and endlessly lavished with a vigorous dose of propaganda which makes a trip to the DPRK so intrinsically weird. Yes, I'm wearing lipstick. This is a visit to the Korean film studio just outside of Pyongyang. The North Koreans have a great sense of humour and suggested I become one of their royal queens for a day. Would you like a picture with the queen? Thank you. And the good luck. And why not let loose? We needed some way of releasing the tension on what was a pretty overbearing trip. But what does the future hold for this hermit nation? In my discussions with Mr. Lee, it became pretty clear that these people are extremely single-minded. And if this generation can see millions of their friends and families wiped out through the famine of the 1990s, how will they tackle the new arduous march which lies ahead? For me, the faces of the North Korean people are now real. I know them, and I can never forget them. Their doctrine may be skewed to my mind, but these are ordinary human beings who have done nothing wrong other than be born under an oppressive regime that has told them what to do and what to think. I've had friends who've criticised me for taking this trip. They've suggested DPRK tourists are only contributing foreign exchange which benefits the North's nuclear ambitions. 
But I was able to tell Mr Lee about how New Zealand once stood up to the Americans when our country banned US Navy ships carrying nuclear weapons from our ports in the 1980s. He'd never heard about this and he was completely fascinated. I hope I left him with a small seed in his mind that there is another way, an alternate path, which he may just very quietly discuss with his family and friends. And that's the great thing about travel. It allows different cultures and people to talk and share ideas and hopefully reconcile a place deep within each other's minds. I know the kids are pretty I'm always the one no one knows Never found somebody like me State of mind is always moving on Cut to the chase and walk quickly Don't need no bullshit from you Maybe you find me quite scary I don't care if so, it's either or Thinking about leaving the city Lately it's making me choke Don't give a damn if I'm silly I don't care if so, it's either or You can choose to win or lose I gave you the choice The world is black or white either Just a-